They were talking about protecting the shipping, okay? So this is just another lie piled on, okay? Now, here's another guy, not one of my favorite guys. At the beginning of this interview, well, I'm calling myself an interview, but this, <laughs> me being on your show this week, Lynn, I gave some accolades to General Maxwell Taylor. And I'll give him a couple more just for the heck of it. You know why? Because when they were alive, the Kennedy brothers seemed to like him, you know? They were both kind of enamored with the guy. You know, Bobby Kennedy used to have Maxwell Taylor over to his house at Hickory Hill all the time. He used to play with the kids. They used to play touch football in the backyard. Bobby was a real rough and tumble guy, you know? He used to be the runt of the family, right? He got bigger and he got tougher. And he, and he liked that. He liked the, 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 that whole idea of, you know, somebody like Maxwell Taylor. And Jack was very close to Maxwell Taylor. Made him the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff after this. See? Interesting, right? I mean, he had Lyman Lemnitzer there. Huh. He writes memorandums 55, 56, and 57, National Security Action Memorandums, right? Pulling the teeth of the CIA, churning all covert operations under the responsibility of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So then he ends up putting Maxwell Taylor in charge of that guy he feels that he can trust. But see, later on, you know, it seems to me that he wasn't so trustworthy. I don't know for sure. Seems like it, though. Seems like JFK even realized it after a while. Because if he was trustworthy, when Kennedy had decided to get out of Vietnam, and I am going to come back to the Bay of Pigs here, but I just want to digress it for a second. That when Kennedy decided he wanted to get out of Vietnam, and as we discussed last time, you know, he sent... Um, Krulak and uh, Mendenhall from the State Department, that Foreign Service officer with Krulak on September 6, 63, to check out Vietnam to come back and give him a report. And Mendenhall said, oh, no, we got to stay there. We got to stay there. It's awful. It's going bad in the, in the fall of the communist, you know. And uh, Krulak said, no, no, I think we can figure out a way over the next period of time here to turn all responsibilities over to the Vietnam, uh, to the Vietnamese themselves, because they knew Kennedy wanted to get out. And Kennedy knew in order to get out of Vietnam and not be accused of being soft on communism again and not get, you know, probably be the victim of a mutiny by his own military or mutiny or a coup, um, that he was going to have to do an end around. He was going to have to have the head people in the military, the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, write a report that suggests that we get out of Vietnam. It's the only way to do it. Because if, if it comes from him, there's going to be too much resistance. Now, getting back to my point about Maxwell Taylor, if he had actually still trusted Maxwell Taylor by this time, and McNamara for that matter, seems like he could have depended on them to actually write the report that he could have then depended on to write National Security Action Memorandum 263 to pull out of Vietnam. But he couldn't trust them to do it. He couldn't trust them to do it. So he had to have Krulak and Prouty and their staff of 16 or whatever it was, secretaries, working 24 hours a day. He had to have them write it while Taylor and McNamara were out of the country in Vietnam doing their fact-finding mission. He had to write it behind their back and then stamp their name on it and then fly somebody to Hawaii to meet them on their way back in Honolulu and then have them present their own report to Kennedy but Kennedy had already had it written himself by somebody else. So had he really trusted Maxwell Teller by then, it seems like he could have gotten Maxwell Teller to write it himself. After all, he did trust him during the Cuban study group. See? So something happened between this point, his relationship with Maxwell Teller, and the end of his administration before his assassination. Something had changed. Okay? And I want to point something out. This same report from Pfeiffer that we're talking about here, he's reporting from the Cuban study group's notes, and it says, during the meeting, General Cabell and Mr. Bissell, so again, we're referring back to the meeting with Bissell, Cabell, and Rusk about the cancellation of airstrikes, okay, and this is coming from Maxwell Taylor. During the meeting, General Cabell and Mr. Cabell were being questioned about the events leading up, I'm sorry, let me take back what I just said. When Cabell and Bissell were being questioned, okay, there's a meeting where Taylor and Bobby Kennedy and Dulles and, um, and Arlie Bur Burke during the Cup Cuban study group are questioning Cabell and Bissell, okay? So not only did Cabell and Bissell write their memorandum that we've already gone over in detail here, but they were all also questioned in front of the members of the Cuban study group, okay? So that's what this is. And it says, during the meeting, General Cabell and Mr. Bissell were being questioned about the events leading up to the cancellation of the D-Day strike. 
General Taylor commented, quote, this was the time to take the issue to the president. The situation did not penetrate the secretarial brain. He is referring to Secretary Rusk. By training, Secretary Rusk is not prepared to deal with this kind of problem, end quote. Okay? That's a quote from Maxwell Taylor following the Bay of Pigs during the Cuban study group. Okay? Now listen, Pfeiffer goes on to say, quote, the sting was taken out of this comment, however, as the memorandum pointed out that General Taylor also criticized General Cabell for his failure to get on the phone with President Kennedy when Rusk offered him the opportunity to present his case against the cancellation of the D-Day strike. Taylor's remark ignored the fact that Cabell stated that Rusk was reporting to the president exactly what he, Cabell, had told Rusk and that Cabell saw no point in personally repeating the information to the president. Again, Pfeiffer's just making that up. That was Pfeiffer's note below what Taylor said. I read what Taylor actually said, and then Pfeiffer writes this. What are you talking about, Pfeiffer? Wherever did you get the notion? Cabell never stated that. He, he says Cabell stated that Russ was repeating to the president. Where does it? Cabell never stated that ever. See? So again, we have this lie that just keeps getting more steam. I mean, at least they changed the lie, right? The original lie was Kennedy refused, you know, air support, presumably from our U.S. Navy. That was the original criticism of Kennedy. Well, after a while, that got changed now because everybody found out after people like Prouty started talking and investigators started researching, all of a sudden people realized, well, wait a minute, that was never part of the plan. It was the D-Day strikes was the problem. Oh, well, so now they changed it. Now they lied and they said that Kennedy's the one who canceled it. Kennedy didn't cancel it, okay? One more thing about Maxwell Taylor, if I'm able to locate it easily and quickly. I may not be able to, but I will try. Um, and again, another kind of a telltale thing in my book. Oh, yeah, I can't find it. It's right here. About Max Taylor. Again, a little bit disturbing, though. In 1972, Maxwell Taylor wrote a book called Swords and Plowshares. Now, again, pointing out what I said a minute ago, I gave Taylor some accolades at the beginning. And like I said, something seems to have changed by the time NSAM 263 and the withdrawal from Vietnam policy. We don't know exactly what it was, but Kennedy obviously didn't trust him enough to have him write a report to get out of Vietnam. And it seems to me that nine years after Kennedy's death in 1972, which would have been what? That would have been 11 years after the Bay of Pigs, which was in 61. Maxwell Taylor writes a book called Swords and Plowshares. And in it, he says this. Now, remember, this is the same guy that I just read all this stuff when he had no dog in the fight, remember? He had been retired. He came out. He was the head of the Cuban study group. No dog in the fight whatsoever. No political connections to the, whatever to this. And he gets down to what appears to me to be the truth. But 11 years later, he writes this in his book. The evidence left no doubt about the inadequacy of the air support of the beachhead and the disastrous consequences to the ammunition supply. Failure to control the air was a result of the inadequacy in numbers and quality of the B-26s. Where did that come from, Max Taylor? That's the first we've heard of any of that. And the lack of sufficient Cuban pilots. Where did that come from, Max Taylor? First we've heard of that. Furthermore, this tiny air force was not allowed to use its full strength against the Castro airfields in the surprise attack on April 15 and had no fighters capable of dealing with Castro's planes particularly the three T-33 jet trainers. Finally, as mentioned previously, on the evening of April 16, President Kennedy canceled the dawn strike scheduled to precede the landing of the brigade. This is Maxwell Taylor. This is the same guy who was in charge of the Cuban study group. The same guy who authored the report that went to Kennedy reporting on the cause of failure of the Bay of Pigs. The same guy who concluded that the reason it failed was because the airstrikes pre-dawn were canceled and the president was never consulted. He confirmed it. Every witness he talked to confirmed it. This wasn't Bob. You can't even earlier you were saying, you know, in the Warren Commission, sometimes they would go off the record and go on there. And, and that seems like the witness got coached and they come back on the record and all of a sudden, oh, you know, it's roses and party time and everything's hunky-dory. And I agree with you. That happened during the Warren Commission, right? But they didn't do that here. 
this isn't Bobby Kennedy inserting stuff into the record. You can't. It's inserted too many times. Are you kidding me right here? See, you've got too many people here, witnesses to this, okay? And at this time, Maxwell Taylor, I think he was probably proud of his position as head of the Cuban Study Group. It said he admired President Kennedy, got along well at this juncture anyway, see? And so he wrote the Cuban Study Group's report. Everyone signed off on it, including Dulles and Bissell, and they knew they were going to get fired. And Cabell, I mean, Cabell and Bissell probably honestly got fired because they didn't tell Rusk, okay, call the president, we'll talk to him. That's probably why they got fired. I'd have done the same thing. I'd have fired them. If somebody called one of my subordinates and changed a plan like that and didn't tell the secretary that they wanted to consult with me, I mean, you know, I probably would have wanted to fire Rusk and Bundy too. But boy, at that stage, man, you're four months into your presidency. What are you going to do, wipe out half your cabinet? You know, I mean, you've already taken, you're taken off the three top people in the CIA immediately, right? Now you're going to get rid of your national security advisor and Dean Rusk? Man, you're going to have a skeleton government if you do that, see? So he was in a real jam there with, as far as Rusk and Bundy goes, as far as I can tell, you know? But it's amazing to me how Maxwell Taylor, you know, 11 years after the fact, changes history in the book that he writes for public consumption. And the, the excuse can't be that it was still classified, see? No, that's, that can't be the excuse. You know, so something happened. So Maxwell Taylor... I don't, I, don't, I don't know what happened with him, but it does, you know, as you look further down the Kennedy presidency, you know, some of these players, um, they, start looking, <laughs> they start looking differently after a while uh, as, you, as you examine, uh, you know, as you examine their, kind of their, their evolution into uh, uh, what they evolved into from what they originally started as. So I think that's I, I think I've covered just about everything, with the exception of maybe one point here. Um, um, I might have mentioned it, but uh, I, I know I said that you know you can go to almost any source and you can get the same lie, the same stuff, and most of the time it's not too specific. You know, it just says that Kennedy broke his promise to provide air support. You know, so just a week before I went to Dallas, uh, I, I checked. Uh, Wikipedia's account of the Bay of Pigs. And when I reached the critical time, time frame, right, the 16th of April, um, which was, uh, you know, the night before the invasion, um, I wasn't surprised that it was going to have mis- or disinformation, but I was surprised by the source, and probably I shouldn't be. But let me quote from Wikipedia. It says, Late on 16 April, President Kennedy ordered cancellation of further airfield strikes planned for dawn on 17 April to attempt plausible deniability of U.S. direct involvement. Ha! Huh, there it is again. And um, the source, though, that Wikipedia cited should have known better, no doubt does know better, because he's the director of the Cuba Documentation Project for the National Security Archives, Mr. Peter Kornblue. And um, that quote was uh, taken from his book, Bay of Pigs Declassified the Secret CIA Report on the Invasion of Cuba. Um, so it still continues to this day. Um, uh, you know, Taylor did it. We just saw himself. You've got this joker doing it, and now it's quoted in Wikipedia from his book. Now, I don't um, trust Wikipedia for anything now. No, nah, it's there. It's... You know, it's a it's a crapshoot. You know, it's not it's not that a hundred percent of it is bad. It's that the you, most people can't tell what's right and what's wrong in there. Well, I'd they, rather you know, have for instance, wrong. Wikipedia has been taken over on the Fletcher Prouty page, and they they will not allow any any links to Prouty.org. If you yeah. look at the talk section, the guy said, "Oh, Prouty.org is not really the official page of Fletcher Prouty." I go, "Yes, it is." He asked me to create it. You know, we worked on it together, and Prouty.org is Fletcher answering email there. Uh, you yep. know, while he was live, everything I ran it, I, I started it. I know it yep. is. You know, yep. so <clears throat> I knew Fletcher Prouty, and so we're talking to a guy who he's pissed off at when I went to critique him. He had a Nazi swastika on his page, and he's all upset that I brought that out. And now yeah. other people at Wikipedia say you can't say anything bad about another Wikipedia admin. I said I don't care. They I banned they, me from even making changes, and other people have taken up. They said, this is 
pathetic. Um, I was one of them. Yeah, I I went on their on the talk page. Yeah. Yeah. And I wish more people would go and visit the talk page and and you know put their two cents in. I don't know if people realize this. Folks out there listening, if you go to, if you if you Google as an example Fletcher Prouty and you go to Wikipedia and you look at the entry on Fletcher Prouty and you go to the to the bottom there's no external link to his own website to his, the official website of Fletcher Prouty. I mean, it's unbelievable they have an external link to McAdams site where he's bashing Fletcher Prouty, yeah. where he's got ad hominem after ad hominem on there against Fletcher Prouty, but they won't allow an external link to to the most comprehensive website on the life, career, and person that was Fletcher Prouty. They won't allow a link there simply because Len at one point had rebutted some of the disinformation that was being put out there uh, by the McAdams website. Misinformation, disinformation, I don't know which it is. I don't even know what his motive for doing it is, and I don't care what his motive for doing it is. It's still, it is still, it is what it is. McAdams, you're talking about. Right, yeah, McAdams, McAdams yeah. has a page called uh, Proudy Truth Teller or Crackpot. So I thought, what, what the fuck's with that, right? So I, I made yep. a page saying, uh, McAdams, the laughing stock of the internet. And all yeah. I did was collect everyone who had written an article or had something to do with McAdams and posted it there. So if you're wondering like how crazy and 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 um, uh, slanted is McAdams' view of history, uh, here's all the people who just correct him, correct him, and he goes spouting his uh, his the world is flat society. I call him the Westboro yep. Baptist Church right. of the <laughs> JFK community. You know that's how crazy those guys are and fanatical. But I've got one better for you. I say don't even go to the Wikipedia page. Just go to Prouty.org. So people yeah, listening, right. click on Prouty.org and just browse through there and read some of the letters and read some of the articles written by Fletcher. Yeah. Um, you know, and hear him in yep. his own words and get yep. get an idea. I'm sure in five or ten minutes you can uh, look at him, um, uh, you know, size up the guy just from using your, you know, common sense and and uh, and gut yep. feeling about something and, and uh, you know, play from there. If you think that you don't uh, – you can't uh, – Trust him as the source. No problem. I have no complaint if anybody says they don't believe it. Uh, I just say, listen, he worked there. He's written about it. He knows the people. So that's good enough for me. If it's not good enough for somebody else, I don't mind that. I don't. But um, for people just to say he's a crackpot or something is just, uh, yeah, you know, it's just crazy. I mean, he worked in the Department of Defense, one of the top 52 people, you know, yep. briefing officers. The top 52 in the, and he didn't get that position, you know, yep. by chance, okay? So yeah. uh, anyway, um, enough about oh, yeah, that. No, but like I say, just yeah. go to Proudy.org and browse around there. Yep. It's interesting, you know, that um, censorship is one of those uh, tools and devices that are used uh, in a fascistic – I think that's a word it may not be uh, – a fascist society. And it's harsher. You know, they say silence is more dangerous – than abuse in many ways. Verbal abuse, you know, if you take a child as an example, and you verbally abuse that child over a number of years, you're going to do some damage. But failure to communicate with the child, the silent treatment, is much, much more damaging. And it's the same thing with the society. When people don't talk out, when people don't tell the truth, and when people restrict others from telling the truth, like, you know, Hassan and Gayat, for instance, when you start restricting what people are allowed to say because you don't like what they say or because you disagree with what they say or maybe you don't like how they said it. That amounts to fascism. You know, and it's interesting sometimes, Len, the people who are most vocal against fascists and fascism, it's amazing to watch it when they begin to practice it through censorship. Very, it's an interesting dynamic. And it's something that, you know, I think we all have to watch out for because, um, even the information that you, know, you and I are talking about now, there's a particular forum that I would have liked to have shared a lot of this with and you know, put the documents up for the first time. Some of this stuff no one's ever seen, I don't think. You know? I mean, it took me forever to find a lot of this, and I haven't even gotten into it. I've, I've covered maybe 25 30% of what well, I look have. Look, at, I don't even push this much, but I'm going to start pushing it from now on. Black Op Radio has a forum. Okay, Greg? Yeah, so there you post go. Post yep. there, and please put some of the documents there, okay? Good deal. Yep. That way uh, we can yeah. link to them when people listen to this interview, you know, maybe years from now, and at least they can know what forum they can trust. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. 
Yeah, that's a really good idea. Len, I have a little laryngitis because I still have a, that slight cold that I kind of picked up on my way to uh, uh, way back from Dallas. So I hope my uh, my it, might, it doesn't hurt, but it feels like it might sound a little bit scratchy. I hope <laughs> I hope it's clear. No problem at all. Okay, well, I um, hope anyone interested in the Bay of Pigs picked up some knowledge from listening to you, uh, and also grounds, you know, food for research, for further thought, and, um, you know, take your insights that you've pointed out and, and dig through the documents and, and paperwork to, to see if actually it's true, and uh, I understand it, uh, you know, exactly what you're talking about, so... Uh, uh, I've been through that before, but anybody new to the case might be really wondering, uh, how is it that these people uh, continue to say one thing about President Kennedy and, and go on and on? And when the documents, all you got to do is read them and they, and they say the opposite, right? Yeah, when, you know, and part of it, there might be a, a much you know, deeper uh, political motivation for it. And again, you know, y you, uh, we know in this case, oftentimes you're thrown off the right track, you know, off the trail of the assassins, right? And I've never been convinced that the anti-Castro Cubans um, were highly motivated to uh, participate in the assassination. And I think some of what we went over here tends to support that notion, that there had to have been a good deal of them that weren't expecting U.S. intervention at all. Now, there is the possibility, however, that a good deal of them uh, weren't aware of it or – thought that Kennedy is the one who canceled the airstrikes. I mean, that, there is a possibility there. So, you know, I don't know how many viewers, or not viewers, but listening audience you have that, um, you know, how many brigade members listen, you know, or families, or people who know stuff from that era that were there, you know, or that were close enough to it, that are aware of, of information that may be vital to the case, that have withheld it understandably, I'm not even blaming them for, you know, I mean, look it, I'm not here to make a moral judgment. Do I think it was right for them to withhold it? No. But maybe they withheld it. I'm asking, if you now can rid yourself of your hatred of our dead president, because for the first time you say to yourself, you mean the guy isn't, he, he didn't abandon us? He's not the one who did this? It was the CIA? It was my handlers at the top? He didn't do this. If you can get past that hatred and you can jog the information out of your soul and give it to the world before you leave it, it would benefit all of us and it may help this, this case. I mean, there's an argument to be made that there was no motivation for anti Castro Cubans because, because they, they didn't blame Kennedy. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that, except the agency seems to always want to. Bring them back up. Let's, you know, let's talk about the mob and let's talk about the Cubans. Well, so it could just be a red herring. If it's not a red herring and there was hatred, I'm here to tell you, do your own research. Look this stuff up. I'm not making it up. And if you can find it in your hearts to say, hey, we were wrong. Our opinion was wrong. He didn't do this to us. And now maybe I need to talk about some of the stuff that I know because the people who acted against him, they really believed that he did this, but they were wrong. Maybe we can get some more information that we don't yet have. All right. Okay, Greg. Thanks so much. I guess it was practically all your presentation, I guess, in, in, in Dallas. I thought you were just going to give a short recap of it, but it, uh, God, we got about two hours here, eh? Wow. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, you know, it's, you have a, you don't have very much time at these conferences, you know, so you have to stuff a whole bunch into a little, uh, a little slot there. So I got to get into much more detail and emphasis here. So I thank you for the time, Lynn. Yeah. Well, that's good then. Uh, okay, let's keep in touch and um, do post some of those things at the forum, okay? Okay. Because uh, I know if you email them to me, there'll just be too many for me. So if you make a little thread on that, uh, I'm sure people will be interested. I am. All right, Glenn, that sounds really good. Hey, you know what? And like you said, people go to the Prouty.org site. They can also go under email replies from uh, uh, Colonel Prouty. And if they scroll down, they'll find a letter that he wrote in response to a question that I had asked him about Colonel Jack Hawkins. And part of it is about the Bay of Pigs. And if they're interested in the subject, there's even a letter there on that. Good. Okay, Greg. All right. Well, Thanks, Glenn, we'll so much. Now. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. 
Okay, and thanks for all your good work. Yeah, right. Thank you, too. Okay. Hey, good night. Okay, good night. All right, so... Are you all there? right? Yeah. yeah, I'm here. So that's going to be the show. Okay, good. <coughs> wow. I...